Well, good morning. I'm MMAC President Tim Sheehy, and welcome back to our weekly webcast from 11 to 12 on Tuesdays, providing you with actionable insights to navigate the COVID crisis as we move to and through the next normal. This webcast is powered by Aurora WDC, a Madison-based market and intelligence firm. They help us make faster and smarter decisions. Visit them at aurorawdc.com. And before we begin, uh, we'd like to go to our sponsor for some advice, Mike Maltesta, the president of ERC Midwest, providing decontamination and disinfection services. Uh, number one, have a WHO plan. For example, who will you call if you need help with contamination? Two, know what it takes to kill COVID-19. Be knowledgeable of CDC and EPA guidelines. Three, get what you pay for. Be aware of the deliverables in the service. Four, demand proof. Get a COVID-19 disinfection certificate. And five, pay the right price to have it done properly. ERC Midwest has a COVID-19 disinfection cert certificate and a discount for MMAC members. For more, visit ercmidwest.com backslash MMAC. Well, much has changed this past week. We'll go to the next slide. Much has changed this past week as Wisconsin businesses are largely up and running or will be this week. There remain some notable exceptions for dine-in restaurants and bars in the city of Milwaukee. So as you move through the COVID crisis, through recovery, we wanna make sure that we can add some additional support as you operate in the next normal. Prevention remains a strong principle, but safer at home is no longer the first line of defense. How businesses operate, creating safe and healthy environments become critical for building employee and consumer confidence. And in addition to our own personal responsibilities as citizens. Today's program has three goals. One, to provide employers with resources to open and operate in the next normal. Two, to give some insights in how public health officers can help you achieve your safety goals and three, to provide some insights into the legal considerations as you do business. To do so, we're joined today by several guests. Dr. John Raymond, President of the Medical College, Dr. Laura Cassidy, Director of Epidemiology in the Medical College's Institute for Health and Equity, Rebecca, Re Rebecca Goodmanson from our M7 MMAC team, Ann Christensen, the North Shore Health Department Director, and Mark Goldstein with the Goldstein Law Group. But to start, I'd like to introduce a new toolkit for employers called Smart Restart Smart Business. This toolkit is designed to help employers navigate best practices in opening and operating their businesses in the post COVID environment. The toolkit, like our daily webinars, has made, was made possible through the partnership and collaboration with the Medical College of Wisconsin. We remain grateful for the insights and expertise of MCW's faculty and the team as they bring this resource to the table. But before we get started with the Smart Restart Smart Business Toolkit, I'd like to bring in Dr. John Raymond, President of the Medical College, who joins us for some introductory comments. Dr. Raymond? Yeah, thanks, Tim, for your leadership and the great partnership that we've enjoyed during this pandemic. Um, we need this toolkit in our region and our state now more than ever. COVID-19 is stealthy and it's virulent and it continues to be in our environment. And by no means have we conquered COVID-19. Now more than ever, we need individuals and businesses to live and work responsibly with the only tools we have available right now, physical distancing, face coverings, hand washing, and frequent cleaning and sanitization. The partnership between the MMAC and MCW and with local health departments, I believe is a positive role model for collaboration going forward. We each need to play a role in helping businesses open and operate safely and sustainably. 
And this toolkit is fundamentally grounded in health and science best practices from the CDC, World Health Organization, OSHA, and our local experts. The toolkit integrates the good work of the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, Wisconsin Manufacturing and Commerce, the MMAC, the academic, medical, and public health communities, and many others who've been working to support businesses and our economy. And again, Tim, I wanna thank you and the MMAC for being such responsible leaders and outstanding partners. And I'll turn it back over to you, Tim. Thanks again, Dr. Raymond. Deeply respect and appreciate the partnership and uh, look forward to moving forward with this toolkit. And to do so, I'm gonna bring in um, uh, uh, both Dr. Laura Cassidy, again, Director of Epidemiology in the Medical College of Wisconsin's Institute for Health and Safety, and Rebecca Goodmanson, uh, two of the key participants in pulling this toolkit together. So Rebecca, I believe we're gonna start with you, uh, and then uh, Dr. Cassidy is gonna join you. Great, thank you, Tim. Good morning, everyone. As Tim and Dr. Raymond stated, MCW and MMAC have worked together to develop the Smart Restart Business Toolkit. Go to the next slide, please. I'm going to walk through the specific aspects of the toolkit and how it can help businesses navigate amongst the threats of COVID-19. Go to the next slide. We started by listening to the local businesses. We understand the pressure of opening and operating safely during the COVID-19 crisis. The toolkit was created as a single place to find the information you need to open and operate safely. It includes links to vetted information from multiple sources, such as the CDC and OSHA, guidance from national, state, and local best practices, and a comprehensive checklist to help open and operate your business safely. This, the steps listed here are how you can start the process. First, identify someone in your organization who will take the lead on the health and safety procedures suggested in the toolkit. Next, identify your local health department contact. Dr. Cassidy and Anne will be speaking to this point later in the webinar. Our third step is to review WEDC's industry-specific guidelines for your business. We use WEDC's best practice guidelines as a jumping off point for the checklist and the next step, but you should take the time to review their guide guidance on your industry specifically. Lastly, use our comprehensive checklist, which I'll dive into next, to implement health and safety best practices. Next slide, please. What you see is a summary of what the health and safety checklist contains. You can find the comprehensive checklist on our website, as well as a printable PDF. The list we developed is based around WDC's best practices and other national vetted guidelines. As you can see, it is broken down into general tasks and policies you should consider while opening and during operation. Within each general section, you will see a list of tasks. For example, under COVID-19, disinfecting sanitation practices. Next slide, please. Back one, if you don't mind. You can see suggested steps and policies related to that topic. Um, I'm missing that slide, but once you click on those that specific uh, introduce COVID-19 disaffecting practices, you will see the a larger list check um, check down that uh, list policies and tasks we suggest. Throughout the whole checklist, we link directly to sources pertaining to the task or policy. For example, in under the disinfecting and sanitation practices, we direct you to MMAC's list of professional decontamination services and EPA cleaning products. You can easily follow along and access links to many more national, state, local, and business resources throughout the checklist. Okay, we can go back to the poster, thanks. We also provide a principal PDF of the sign seen here to help build confidence amongst your employees and customers that you are following steps to protect your workforce and the community around you. Next, Dr. Cassidy with the Medical College of Wisconsin will dive deeper into health and science behind the toolkit. 
Hello, thank you. It's a privilege to be here today talking with all of you and I've learned so much from the business community. It's been a great partnership. Next slide, please. We created this toolkit because there's so much information out there that it's overwhelming. Every day there's new information, there's new guidance, and um, it's, it can be overwhelming. So we started looking at the information that was out there and what we felt was important and we felt was accurate. And then, you know, when I first looked at guidances from major corporations, it could be overwhelming as well. So we wanted to conceptualize a framework and how you think about this for your particular business. And we know that the virus spreads from person to person and it can be spread through things we touch. So we came up with the concept and the framework of protect the workforce, protect the customers and protect the facility. And when we have these guidelines for you, there's some general topics that apply to everybody. But when you're thinking about your own business and your own interactions, there are ways you're going to have to tailor it to meet your specific needs. So the things you need to think about are the number of people in any given space, how they interact, how the employees interact with each other, how they interact with their customers, and how they interact with the facility. We do know that the more people in one space for a longer duration increases the risk of spread. So for example, if you have a hair salon, you have one employee and one customer, and they are interacting closely. They have to touch each other, but the other customers do not need to touch each other, and the other employees do not. But they're also using the facility, so you have to think about how do you protect that individual customer, that individual employee, and the things they touch. And that can be through face masks, through sanitizing the environment in between customers, and um, thinking about that approach. Also increasing ventilation, opening doors and windows is good. But then if you have another situation like a fitness center where you have a few employees and many customers and they're moving from equipment to equipment to equipment, if somebody has the virus, they can pass it from equipment to equipment and you can see how it could spread throughout the facility. So there you need to be extra specially cautious about your equipment and how you sanitize it. You might wanna do things like schedule appointments for working out so you don't get too many people in there. So these are, you know, you have to be creative in how you think about this. Next slide, please. And so the things we know is that the virus is spread from person to person and things we touch. And so it goes in through your mouth and that's how you get it, your nose, mouth and eyes, your respiratory system, and that's how it comes out. So since it's spread from person to person, social distancing remains incredibly important. If we stay away from each other, the virus has nowhere to go. And since it goes in through your respiratory system and out through your respiratory system, it's very important to use face coverings as much as possible when you're around other people. Close that door, don't let it in, don't let it out. And then again, it's so hard not to touch our face with our hands. So that's why it is so important to continue diligent hand washing, keep doing it. Um, I don't even think we realize how much we touch our hands and touch other things and touch our faces. So that's, that's really important. And also the disinfecting. You can clean, but cleaning does not necessarily kill the virus. It can remove some of the surfaces and grit where it might live and thrive, but you need to disinfect it to kill it. So we have the tools. We have tools at our disposal to prevent the spread. And we need to close the door, not let it in. We need to practice social distancing and wash our hands. And finally, if somebody's not feeling well, we need to enable them to stay home and to um, get testing in order to stop the spread. Thank you very much. So, okay. yeah, uh, um, Dr. Cassie and Rebecca, maybe a quick question for you both. Um, so if folks want to get the toolkit, um, how do they get access to the toolkit? Where is it? I, I guess I'll ask that of you, Rebecca. And then Dr. Cassie, as we've gone through the toolkit and the procedures, you, you all have really taken a close look to make sure that they comply with the standards uh, needed. So this is kind of a toolkit that has been brought from best practices, but also vetted by the medical college. Correct. 
question, Tim. Thanks uh, for making that introduction. Yes, the toolkit can be found on MMAC website, I believe, um, is linked on the side with more information. Um, and there's downloadable pages um, with the infographic, the um, checklist, as well as the signage on that website as well. And, and you don't and have also, to be a member to get it. Oh, no, you do not have to be a member to get access to the toolkit. And it's also on the MCW website in the same way with the downloadables as well. And so, you know, all of the information, we didn't really create anything new, but what we're doing is working with our local health departments, working with businesses to understand what people need. And then we're looking at the information to make sure it's organized in a way that's useful to businesses. Thank you. Very, very helpful. And I know you're both going to stick around uh, when we get to questions. So um, let me bring in Ann Christensen now. And Ann, you've been uh, on this uh, program with us before and greatly appreciate uh, your time and expertise. And I, I, I want to start kind of with a series of questions uh, for you. And we'll start with one now. Um, as the state has kind of receded back in terms of safer at home, it's really put folks like you in the forefront uh, in terms of um, complying and what needs to happen for companies uh, to deal with uh, COVID and the different protocols that are out there. So I, I think one of the questions that companies have today as they start to open again and operate is what, what constitutes an outbreak and what are the protocols that, employ that an employer should follow and what can they expect from their local health department? Yeah, that's great. Um, so we see uh, COVID in terms of two areas. One is prevention of the spread. And I think the toolkit that was just presented or presented does a really good job of preparing businesses for how they can be part of the prevention strategy. So with Safer at Home going away and uh, that prevention strategy largely focused on people staying at home, uh, the toolkit and the business community really are uh, going to be key elements of how we can further prevent the spread as we start to loosen those restrictions. Uh, in terms of outbreak, that's the other side, which is the controlling the spread within a workplace or other setting. Um, so it is currently defined by the Wisconsin Department of Health Services as two cases in a facility. Uh, that's a pretty low threshold, uh, and that's intentional in that it allows us to be very proactive before a situation gets out of control, so to speak, um, so that we can work with those, uh, the business community. But for us, in terms of outbreak at the local health, that's much more widespread than just the business community or an employer. But in this context, so working with that employer to uh, identify who has the disease and then who's been uh, exposed to the disease. And our process at that point is to understand what that risk of exposure is for those who've been, uh, who've been identified as having been in close contact. That's a really important tool for us because then with the tools we have available and with identifying those contacts, that's where we break that spread or break that transmission chain by quarantining or recommending quarantine for those who are at medium and higher risk of exposure so that then we don't continue to spread that uh, the virus throughout the workplace setting. Uh, so there's a lot of elements there that happen once we've identified cases in a workplace setting. Uh, it could even be a one case where we will still want to activate that process of contact tracing and identifying those at risk and making recommendations from that point. So an outbreak is uh, a term, but really it's more of the process that we do to uh, further control the spread in that facility. And so how does the uh, how does the health department get informed if there is an outbreak? I suppose potentially an employee could call, the company could call themselves, or you find out through um, other information. Yeah, so multiple ways, just as you said. So one of the primary ways is anybody who goes in to get tested, we are notified by state statute of that test result, be it positive or negative. Once we are aware of the positive result, we and this has been shared more publicly, but we contact that individual and determine you know, who they might have been around within their infectious period. An infectious period is determined to be two days before signs and symptoms all the way through that uh, a 10 day period 
after onset of signs and symptoms. So that's a pretty long duration of time that somebody may be infected. If they were at work in any of that time, then the workplace setting would be a place where we would call for further investigation uh, to determine who at that workplace setting has been exposed. We obviously work with the case the individual exposed to understand you know what their workplace setting is like and who we can contact um, and then working with that uh, either could be HR for some workplaces it could be that person's supervisor um, really that depends on the situation and who might again have been exposed to determine what our next steps are in some cases we may uh, notify just you know, one or two employees, if that's really the limit of the contact investigation. And for other settings, it's, you know, a whole shift or uh, a whole, uh, co you know, company floor. It really depends, again, on the, the situation and how long that person was at work sick. So going back to the toolkit, one of the elements is that's why it's so important to identify somebody early with their symptoms and to make sure they proactively go home because the fewer days they're on the floor or in the workplace, the fewer additional people that would be exposed by that person. So these are really important tools that will break that transmission. Yeah, and I think uh, as you've described this, the role of the Department of Health is really to come in and help employers. It's not to descend on an employer and try and shut them down. You want to provide information and you want to get information. Yeah, I mean, we want the same things that employers in our community want. We want people to be healthy and safe. We want a safe workplace. Um, and we want to prevent the spread of COVID. So working in partnership is, is our role in terms of local health. Um, and making sure that people are safe and protected. Um, we try to do this in a transparent way so that we're communicating effectively, and that's, all, again, our goal. Um, and the tools that we have available are ones that uh, are based in science, and, and, and it helps to be proactive on both sides so that we can, again, uh, prevent something from getting much more out of control than it needs to be. So, Ann, help us. I know this may be a difficult question to look ahead a little bit. Um, yeah. And as it stands today, uh, Ozaki, Wash Washington, and Waukesha counties, and most of Milwaukee County um, are operating uh, with Safer at Home again, uh, be being relaxed or rescinded. Um, the city of Milwaukee does have some, um, I guess, restrictions in place would be the way to put it. But what happens going forward if there is an outbreak in the community? What triggers a response from uh, the local um, health departments, and, and how does that look going forward? Yeah, we've been operating as a regional uh, system for, for a long time, even before COVID. Um, so if there is a case of uh, COVID-19 in a workplace setting, it's likely that there are multiple health department jurisdictions impacted because that person may work in a different jurisdiction. They may, you know, frequent a shop in another place. So again, we work fairly collaboratively with our other local health departments in our area to support investigations. Um, and I believe that that would continue uh, regardless of which communities have these restrictions in place. Um, I think that, uh, you know, obviously now with it being on a local level, different communities are looking at their disease cases and their vulnerable populations in different ways and making different decisions about what parameters for uh, closures or openings need to be in place based on those. But again, I guess I go back to this toolkit and why it's so important for the business community to be part of this discussion is really this is what we have uh, moving forward to work in partnership to to prevent the spread. So if people are no longer going to be safe at home or at home, and they're going to be in the workforce, they're going to be frequenting stores, uh, out shopping, going to restaurants, let's make sure we're putting in place the best tools that we can in those settings to prevent the spread so that we can be both out in the community and protected. And I think that that's why um, I think this is a good approach to take. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to, to seeing, uh, you know, the business community step up and, and take these proactive measures. Well, thank you uh, very much, Ann. Um, and I uh, know you're going to stick around for questions. And so we're just going to finish out the first part of the discussion here. Uh, by bringing uh, Mark Goldstein in with the uh, Goldstein Law Group. Um, and anytime we talk about a workplace, Mark, there are challenges, there are risks. 
uh, and I think you've got some uh, advice uh, for our viewers uh, as uh, businesses operate in this new normal. I think you got your on mute, Mark. Uh, there we go. There Thank you, go. Tim. And good to be with you. Yes. Uh, so um, if we could go to my first slide. Thank you. So you've seen this helpful infographic, helpful infographic and uh, this was provided by the uh, Medical College several weeks ago, and now we have the MMAC toolkit. Um, my intention this morning is to talk about how we implement these principles and to tee up your questions and a discussion about all the legal and practical considerations that come into play. Next slide, please. So we start with the preliminary considerations, and whenever you hear a lawyer talk, uh, you hear a lot of uh, on the one hand, but on the other, or it depends. And you also hear some disclaimers. And so let's get those out of the way uh, right at the outset. Uh, first of all, much of what we're talking about depends upon uh, your, your workplace. As we heard earlier in the discussion about the toolkit, there are specifics to your workspace, your workforce, uh, and so on that come into play. And we saw that with, uh, with meatpacking just a few weeks back. Uh, there's lots to talk about with respect to your work, workspace, and one of the things that has not been discussed a whole lot is the nature of the building you're in. For example, are there common areas, are there common restrooms, uh, the elevators, and so on. So that's a consideration that comes into play. Another really big one is the culture of your, work, your, your uh, workforce. Um, in uh, Tul Gawande's recent article in The New Yorker on this topic, he said it's all about balancing safety and freedom. And basically employees are saying to us, keep me safe, but otherwise leave me alone. Uh, we'll return to that in a moment. But the challenge is, how does, uh, does an employee feel comfortable saying, I'm worried about my sore throat, so I'm gonna stay home? Or I'm okay with being reminded to pull my mask up. Uh, that's a test of kind of what kind of culture you have and what you can ask and what you need to prompt employees to to uh, lead with themselves. Also, are your employees used to taking direction? Think about members of an orchestra versus uh, an over the road uh, driver. Or do they work independently or collaboratively? Do you have a very permissive dress code? Or do, you do your employees wear uniforms and hard toed shoes? Uh, and then there are special considerations with respect to remote employees. Uh, for example, temperature taking just doesn't happen the same way if folks don't come into headquarters. And Employees that go on site with customers now have to deal with whatever uh, protocols are in place there as well. So for all those reasons, it's important to uh, say that nothing I'm sharing today is legal or medical advice tailored to your circumstance. We have to take all this, including the toolkit, and apply it. Next slide, please. So in front of you now are all the various legal considerations that come into play. And as you can see, there are federal and state laws, there's new and existing, and then there's a plethora of available guidance as well. And that includes OSHA's guidebook and the new CDC materials, and of course, the toolkit. I'm happy to return to any or all of these uh, later in the presentation, but the important thing to understand is that they all intersect, and that's where a lot of the, uh, the challenge comes. Next slide, please. So if that seems overwhelming, it's because it is overwhelming. And one tool that might help cut through all this is something that we've borrowed from negligence law. It's from the Carroll Towing case, which is a famous case with a famous judge with a great name. Uh, his name was Learned Hand. It's a case about a barge that broke loose in the New York Harbor in 1943, and it resulted in a collision with a tanker and damage to boats and a loss of cargo. And Judge Hand came up with this formula. The burden is the burden or cost of preventing the issue. The probability, the P, is the probability of something bad happening and L is the gravity of that damage. The challenge with the learned hand formula is, is that what, what is reasonable to us in the moment uh, in managing our workplace is not necessarily how it's gonna be judged down the road by a judge or jury or by a third party. So next slide, please. We have to think about all the potential points of friction that we have in our workplace. And I've, ident I've identified some of them here. For example, there are a whole series of flashpoints between employer and employee. If you have an employee that's been working remotely until the present, they might challenge you on, why do I have to return? Why can't we continue this way? And the question is whether you can point to issues of productivity, 
engagement, if you can measure any of that or be specific about any of that as the reason you're returning. It's also important to point out that employees might be saying those things not because they're uh, lazy or unwilling, it's because they're anxious or because they have childcare issues or because they're caring for someone who has a chronic issue themselves. There are also employees who may be eager to return to work. They want to show they're a team player. Uh, they want to get out of the house. But looking at these uh, at-risk worker categories, you might say, I'm not sure that's a good idea. And then the question becomes, is there a leave uh, option available? Is continued remote work available? The two key takeaways here are to be consistent with exceptions that are bona fide, or thoughtful, and defensible. And number two, to be sure to get past your first instinct, uh, your first instinct of no, of that's unreasonable, that's unfair. Uh, the ADA has taught us that for a, for a long time. One example of this is this, the discussion of staggered shifts either bringing people back in a staggered fashion or staggering their shifts, their days, their weeks. Uh, there's an interesting uh, experiment happening, happening in Austria uh, at present. Where it's called uh, four days on and 10 days off. So uh, uh, folks are uh, working four days on and then 10 days off. Uh, the premise here is, is that if uh, COVID takes uh, three days to take hold and be communicable, um, if people are working just a short bit, it cuts the uh, virulence down uh, tremendously. Uh, next slide, please. Then we have the issue of how we communicate with employees or educate them. For example, uh, is doing disinfecting and, and hygiene during the day while they're there reassuring to employees, or does it create anxiety that there might be someone who's sick here? Um, are you prepared to answer all the employees' questions, and are your supervisors prepared to answer their questions? Uh, for example, what type of PPE are we using or not using, and why? And what are employees charged with doing themselves? Uh, my example earlier about volunteering, I have a sore throat. Is that uh, something that bumps up against your attendance policy or is that something that you've given permission for? And then I think we heard about it earlier, this idea of uh, being prepared for rapid response. Point, point people for inquiries, for sanitation, for emergencies, the health and safety champions who are the go-to people for these kinds of questions. Also talk to other business owners who have been operating throughout this period. What have they done that has worked? What have they experienced? No doubt they've had a scare. No doubt they've had a positive test that they've had to deal with and you can learn from that. In fact, in that article I referenced earlier by Atul Gawande, he talks about the fact that while we can't turn every workplace into an operating room, there's a lot that we can learn from healthcare about what's worked and what hasn't. Next slide, please. So finally, we come to some knotty issues involving the employees themselves, your customers, and you. First of all, with respect to the employees and temperature taking, uh, we all know of the story uh, of uh, people who send their children to daycare. Maybe they have a cold, maybe they have a fever, but hopefully I won't get a call. Uh, the same is true in this context. We have employees who they might take ibuprofen to suppress a, a temperature, or they might just be hoping. In, in any event, they need to work, they want to work, that might not be the right answer for you. And then we have the new, newly named Karen problem where everyone in essence has a different standard and uh, believes their standard is better or more than everyone else. And how do employees look at their fellow employees in terms of how they're behaving and, um, and whether that's reasonable and whether that is uh, creating issues for the workplace. With respect to customers, there are two sets of issues here. Number one is uh, at what point are you bringing people on site and for what purpose? Uh, it's one thing to secure the premises and feel pretty good about your employees. It's another thing to open it up to meetings with third parties. And then the very challenging topic of, you know, do we ask customers to wear masks? If you are a place that has safety glasses, if you are a place that says no shoots, no shoes, no shirt, no service, uh, that might be a little easier. But it's still a, a challenge to um, give your employees the authority to communicate that. And there's a, a wonderful book by Dove Steven called How that talks about how one does that um, without offending uh, your guests and your clients. And then there's finally the issue of yourself. What precisely are you trying to accomplish? Are, are you wearing a mask because you want to model it for your, for your employees? Or are you unwilling to model a ma uh, wear a mask? And then creates that creates issues for, uh, for your workforce. Are you eager to get back to business? Um, are you eager to be top of mind with your customers? And maybe most importantly, can you operate profitably in this environment? And what does that mean in terms of getting back 
sooner versus later. I think uh, we'll leave it there for now. There's lots more to discuss, but uh, looking forward to the questions and discussion. Mark, really uh, great oversight uh, and some interesting insights. I found myself uh, taking a lot of notes, uh, just thinking about our own workplace as you were walking through that. So um, I'd invite you to stay on and our other panelists to join in. Um, and I know we have a number of questions uh, already. And if you do have questions, please go ahead and submit them. Uh, and we'll run through as many as we can uh, before the hour is up here. So Chris, uh, let's start out uh, with the questions you have. Uh, yeah, uh, first question immediately for Mark is, could you better define the Karen problem? And I'll send that shout out to our coworker, Karen. <laughs> Sure, and with all due respect to anyone named Karen, I did not name this, um, but the Karen problem is uh, within the past month, uh, the idea of uh, a person coming up to people on the street saying, are you people related? Shouldn't you be six feet apart? Uh, the judgment that comes of other people's behavior, that takes on a whole new dimension in the workplace when you're talking about fellow employees. Great, thank you. Uh, another question, and maybe Tim and some other folks could chime in on this. Because of the Supreme Court ruling and uh, many municipalities not having a superseding order in place, it should be clear that uh, what we're putting forth today are just guidelines. But Tim and some others, why is it of in the business's best interest to implement these guidelines in terms of consumer confidence and employee confidence? Well, I think uh, you know Dr. Raymond and Ann and others can chime in here, but uh, the answer to the question is. Uh, the uh, end of the question that you put up and really to move forward to live, work, play and learn, it's really going to be dependent upon our own independent actions as citizens. And then from a company perspective, building employee confidence and consumer confidence is really key to the recovery and moving forward um, until uh, at some point we have a vaccine. And so it's really the root of, I think, the whole program today is to arm employers with best practices, to give them confidence that they can implement this, to back it up with the best knowledge we have at the medical college, to reach out to our uh, health uh, department professionals like Ann and others, uh, so we come through this um, in the most uh, expeditious and, and safe way, uh, in, in, most, in, in a safe way. Dr. Raymond, Anne, Laura. Tim, you said it, you said it well. You know, the, the virus is potentially lethal. It can be contagious when you have no symptoms. And I think in order to restore both employee and consumer confidence in the workplace, we all need to take the only actions we can, which are the ones that we've mentioned with social distancing, good hand hygiene, frequent sanitization, and minimizing the chances in the workplace and in the business to pass that silent virus along. And this is Anne, as we look to uh, post safer at home, the strategy for turning the dial up slowly is still uh, the strategy from a public health perspective that we need to operate in. Uh, we know that from our modeling that if we quickly turn up the dial without any protective measures in place, we're likely to see that spread overwhelm our healthcare system. So moving forward in a slow method and slow process with these guidelines and protective measures allows us to accomplish the goal of turning up the dial slowly. It's just now with different tools. And I think that by providing guidelines that have been reviewed and vetted to the community, there's so much information out there that people often grab onto what they want to believe instead of um, ways we can actually um, control this virus instead of letting it control us. Great, thank you. We also had a lot of questions about taking employees' temperatures as a screening method, both from a legal perspective and from a procedural perspective. If you do it, should you ask them to self-report? Should you do it on site, out in a line, in a private office? Um, I'd be interested in everyone's perspective on that. So let's get the health then. answer first and then the legal answer. That's fine. Well, there's many different ways of doing it. And I think it's going to depend on your individual business and, and how people um, interact. Um, 
you know, the ideal case is to screen them at home and then have them take their temperature at home. And if they have a temperature, stay home. And then if they show up at work, screen them before they come in. Um, sometimes the ideal way is not the practical way. And so um, you, you have to instill a sense of responsibility in people. And if you are doing it, say it's a manufacturing plant and you're screening people before they come in, you also have to make sure the people who are doing that are protected in case somebody is positive. Mark? You don't have to remember temperature screening isn't particularly sensitive for COVID-19. It should be part of a comprehensive program of symptom reporting. And whether you do that by self-report or you take their temperatures um, probably doesn't matter. It's the, it's the act of doing some sort of screen where people take personal responsibility for um, their exposure to other people. And again, that problem with symptom screening here is that people can be contagious before they even have any symptoms whatsoever. And again, the fever is probably one of the, the least sensitive indicators of COVID-19. Yeah, I'll just add from a legal perspective, there are a few other challenges and, and this supports what Dr. Cassidy was saying. Number one is the issue of employee privacy. You don't want a long line and some people are going to the left and some are going to the right and it becomes kind of a shaming. Uh, there are all sorts of legal protections in place right now, the FFCRA and so on, where, uh, where folks uh, can still qualify for benefits if they're not able to work. So it shouldn't be kind of seen as disqualifying. Uh, but the other piece is, is that um, uh, the folks who are taking the temperature should be trained a little bit in terms of what device they're using, how to use it, and as Dr. Cassidy said, protected, uh, so that um, they themselves are not uh, running a risk by doing that. Thank you. We had several questions about contact tracing and an employer's responsibility in that, uh, in the sense that if there is a positive case in a workplace, and should they call their local health department first, or do they have their own responsibility in terms of tracing employees' contacts? Yeah, that if they have an employee that tests positive, the local health department that is uh, where that employer is located should be one of their first phone calls. Again, we can help with that contact tracing process in that we've got the latest protocols from both the CDC and the Department of Health Services. So rather than the employer taking down that role, we would, uh, we would want to be part of that process. Uh, Mark, legally, if an employee doesn't pass a health screening, either temperatures or a questionnaire, can they be required to go get tested and subsequently, if they get a negative test and they come back? I don't know that you can require they get tested. Um, oftentimes, the employer has the ability to strongly urge, which has the same effect. Um, but fundamentally, um, uh, no, they're, they're sent home and they're either uh, on a quarantine or, or reporting back to you on their condition. I'm not sure you can require it, um, but uh, I'll, I'll let the medical folks weigh in on that one as well. In terms of public health, we cannot require testing. Related question about whether Mark, if an employee shows up with symptoms and or should they be required to get a doctor's note to return? Uh, so yeah, there are two dimensions to that. One is, is that um, you can request some medical evidence for the return, but uh, the doctor's offices are so busy that the traditional doctor's note uh, has been at least identified by the Department of Labor as, as not necessary. So there should be some some support for the fact they're cleared, but it may not be the, the doctor's note that you're, you've come to be familiar with. And we had a question about whether your staff gets tested regularly. Do they have access to testing? And how much of contract tracing is done in person versus on the phone? Uh, taking that for second question, the majority of it is done on the phone. Very little is actually done in person. Um, and that does kind of go to your first question, which is, are we regularly uh, tested? And actually, the answer is no. Uh, similar to other work workers and employees, uh, we are screening ourselves for signs and symptoms. And uh, if we have signs and symptoms, we then proceed in terms of calling our provider to be tested but we are not proactively testing ourselves because actually our exposure to the general public is pretty limited back to the, your point because most of our work is done by, by a phone. Uh, for Dr. Raymond and Dr. Cassidy, we did have one question about whether there's any downside to wearing your own personal face covering 
uh, with a uh, an attendee who heard it could quote unquote lock in the virus and make actually make you more likely to get it. I would assume that, that that's not part of the recommendation. Well, I'll just start and say, um, I've heard a lot about that. And what I would say is that's probably not true that you what you're trying to do is protect other people by wearing your cloth face covering and if you have the virus you already have it it isn't going to be quote unquote locked in and then re-inhaled by that person who's infectious i would say one of the things i've seen a lot of though is people wearing them incorrectly um, covering their mouth and leaving their nose out which um, isn't best practice or if it or playing with them too much Mark, we had a question about what recommendations you can make to an employer about encouraging employees to practice social distancing and other good practices outside the workplace. Is there anything that an employer can do in that respect? Uh, yes, that's a great question. Thank you. So uh, there are there are really two or three things. Uh, one is is that um, in in the in the manner in which you behave in the workplace, hopefully folks see that as uh, as best practices and and take that to their personal lives. Uh, for example, if you couple your um, your temperature taking with questions at the start of the day about um, have you been around anyone with uh, with uh, COVID related symptoms or have you felt uh, any COVID related yes. symptoms, people know that that they're going to be regularly prompted on that. As Dr. Raymond said, I believe you know it, the temperature taking counts for as much as the temperature as the protocol, right? So um, that kind of screening. So uh, another piece, which is to the extent that you have signage or um, or um, or uh, re reworked your workplace so that people are standing six feet apart, you're again reinforcing those kind of behaviors. Uh, but the other thing you're saying is, is that, you know, we are uh, number one to being, op being open is keeping everyone safe. And we're charging you with, uh, with doing that and being part of this team. And so there's also a cultural component to it as well in terms of the ability to continue coming to work and keep their, their uh, fellow employees safe. It's going to be a great challenge as the weather improves and as things loosen a little bit. And as I said, everyone has their own standards as to what's okay. But um, the uh, the theory here is that lawyers, I'm sorry, lawyers and employers are a source of, uh, of good, good practice, good information. And that to the extent we can push that out to our employees, they trust us, they'll take that with them and uh, and hopefully incorporate it. Yeah, Mark, we're getting a good solid run of legal questions here, so we're glad we're here. Um, could you talk about the idea that if an employer is trying to protect people who are in, in an at-risk group, so say they're they're a little bit older or maybe they have a pre-existing medical condition, and ask them to stay home, do they expose themselves to a potential discrimination lawsuit? Uh, potentially, but what I'm talking about here is really a dialogue with folks like that. In other words, you don't want someone who is so eager to come back because they want to or have to, but they don't know that there are other possibilities. This is really the flip side of what I talked about a moment ago uh, about the employee that says, well, I was working from home. Why can't I continue to do that? For some people, that might be the best option. And two or th you know, there are two or three places we're getting a lot of questions. One is people with underlying conditions or pre-existing conditions. And the other is uh, people who are pregnant, or um, who, uh, who have childcare issues and trying to figure out how hard do I push, how hard can I push to bring those folks back? Sometimes the answer is um, it, it's not the right, the right thing to do. And sometimes you may as the employer have to be the one to make that suggestion and think creatively. Mark, you also, I believe may have mentioned a book earlier. What was the name of that book? Sure, the book is called How by Dove Seedman. Uh, and it's all about how we behave as a driver of our culture. And he makes a great point in that book about, you know, three kinds of employees when it comes to wearing safety glasses. There are the ones who say, you know, we wear safety glasses here, but you don't have to, never mind. Uh, there's a second one that says, we wear safety glasses because the boss makes us. And then the third one says, we wear safety glasses here. Here, here are your glasses. And what I'm simply suggesting is, if your workplace is a place where you're, you're wearing masks, applying that same approach, that you might make to hard-toed shoes or to safety glasses to masks might be the best way to go. And if so, it's what you really have to charge your employees with doing so they don't bump into customers, offend customers, offend visitors 
when they make that suggestion. We had another question, and this may be a chance to bring in everybody's perspective, from an employee who has been working from home effectively and now feels some pressure from their supervisor to go back in the office just because the, the supervisor feels that's the right thing to do. If this employee who's feeling that pressure wanted to guide a conversation with their supervisor, what are some tips they could use? Well, I, I mean, I think this is a really challenging question uh, and one that uh, employers across the board are dealing with. And I'll use our organization as an example. We have everybody working from home. And as we start now to institute protocols um, and what Dr. And Raymond and I have been talking about for six months is now coming to fruition uh, in terms of how do you execute. And so if we open the office back up, and we don't require everybody to wear a face mask. Um, and some people are concerned that that's not a safe environment and they don't wanna come back. Then you end up with kind of a, a split group within your office. If we require everybody to wear a face mask and when they come back to work, how long do we do that? At what point do we as an employer feel like it's safe for people not to wear a face mask? Uh, as Mark pointed out, as people come into the office What's the protocol for doing that? Um, and then as a kind of a final point here, as a real life example of how fast this happens, we had a group of, let's say, half dozen of our employees out on another project site. They came in contact with another group of employees, some of whom had face masks on, some of who didn't, who came from a separate project and just got a call this morning that one of those uh, employees had tested positive for COVID. Um, and so now what's our protocol coming back for the six folks to are trying to figure out if they were in proximity of the individual that did test positive. So this becomes complicated very quickly and it's very important. Um, we can take our own advice here and look at our uh, toolkit as we start to stand up our businesses because this becomes complex very fast, dealing with your customers and dealing with your employees and creating an environment um, that is safe, that's hospitable, that you don't unwittingly make hosp hostile uh, because of actions that you take. Yeah, Tim, well, that is perspective well, on that too. Yeah, that's really well said. And it's tough. I think um, as an employer, you you have an obligation to set expectations clearly, to communicate them consistently, um, and have a dialogue, like Mark said. But I, I would also say tie your expectations into your published policies and procedures. And if those need to be updated, then make that a priority. And I would just add that, you know, we've been talking for a few weeks now on these webinars about how to make, for example, washing hands or mask wearing uh, acceptable and a norm. And we've learned it's much harder than it would seem. And one challenge I'd give you all uh, to think about is if you have a policy of mask wearing, and you're in your office and you're stepping out of your office to talk to an assistant, are you putting your mask on? Why or why not? And I think the sooner we come to terms with those kinds of issues, uh, the better off we'll be. And I'm not here telling you one way or the other. I'm simply saying that in terms of the culture, in terms of how we implement this toolkit, that's kind of where the rubber meets the road. Great. Dr. Cassidy and Dr. Raymond, we did have a question about the concept that a face mask doesn't protect the wearer as much as it protects everyone. Could you go over that a little bit? Laura, do you want to take that? Uh, you can take it. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, the, the idea is to protect people around you. Some cloth face coverings may provide you a little bit of protection, but really what you're trying to do is stop the spread of respiratory droplets when you talk, when you sneeze, when you cough, maybe even when you breathe, um, so that you're not spreading your droplets to somebody else. And there's very clear evidence that even a minimal cloth face covering does reduce that burden of droplets that you would be spreading around you. And we had a question from somebody who lives in Milwaukee County, but took a pre-operation test in Ozaki County and turned out negative. As a procedural matter, where would that test have been recorded? Uh, it would be recorded in their resident jurisdiction. So if they live in Milwaukee County, whichever municipality they live in, that's the health department that would be reported those results. And we also had a question about 
how comfortable you feel with uh, your department and other public health departments' ability to contract trace at this point? Right. That is one of the um, the questions that uh, will be a challenge as we move forward. In terms of where we are right now, my counterparts and I feel pretty comfortable with the ability to contact trace. Uh, we've also been making plans for surge through various mechanisms, one being working with the Wisconsin Department of Health Services and also working with the Volunteer Corps. So there are those resources in place. Uh, but as we uh, expand and into the unknown with regard to how where our cases are going to go, we may need to draw on those resources and stand up additional ones. Great, thank you. Mark, we had a, a question that follows up on an earlier question about what you can do for an employee's behavior outside the workplace. Can you ask them to report if they've been in a potential high transmission locale? I think we've all seen some of the TV reports from bars and restaurants. Um, over the weekend. Can can you legally ask an employee to report that they've been in one of those locations? You can. And uh, there's a question about what you can do with the results or if it turns out that they were not being truthful. You may recall on my slide of legal considerations, there's employee privacy, employee speech, um, all sorts of things that come into play on duty, off duty. But I think very much like the temperature taking, having these protocols that, that they know that in the morning, my temperature is going to be taken. I'm going to be asked these three questions. Will uh, will will affect behavior. Dr. Raymond, maybe a quick question for you or or for Laura or Ann. Um, the advice is clearly for uh, workplaces that are opening, and let's just talk about offices uh, that you should wear a mask. Uh, in particular, if you're going out into common areas in the office outside of your own office. At, at what point and, at, and what indicators would an employer look at to um, relax that requirement or, or drop that requirement? Well, um, that's a really a hard question to answer. I would say until we have a vaccine or herd immunity that um, the, the right thing to do would be to wear a mask in, within the public places in your office. I'm, I've got mine right here that my wife made for me that I put on even if I go out in, uh, to, to the refrigerator in that common area. So I would say that. Um, I, I'm not really sure that, uh, that we can enforce that uh, consistently. Mark would need to say, we're actually having some people that have come back to MCW that don't want to wear a mask. And it's created some friction in the workplace. And you know, again, I think we're all trying to set the right, the right example. Had another question, and Mark, you might be best positioned to address this. If an employee goes on a personal travel trip to see family in another state, um, can they required, be required to report that? And, and what should they do? Should they quarantine for 14 days? Or how can an employer handle that situation? Yeah, excellent question. So this was a question we got a lot back in early April um, and, uh, and less lately because, uh, because of the spread. But the answer is yes, you can require they report it. The question becomes, what do you do with the result? And some employers are saying, uh, you know, you have to self-quarantine. Some folks can work remotely, some can't. Um, and, uh, and so the, the, you, you can most certainly ask the question. Uh, the ultimate issue is what do you do with the information you get from that? Then another legal note, uh, can property owners, landlords, business owners be held liable if they don't provide signage and hand sanitizer and some of these recommendations that are out there? Ah, so uh, not necessarily liable in that sense. There's a Wisconsin Safe Place statute that comes into play, and also if it's a business owner, workers' comp. Um, but a lot of that is still yet to be determined on what best practices are, and that's why I thought it valuable to introduce the learned hand strategy, because when we think about what the burden, what the cost is, I think we're all going to be second-guessed if we didn't have hand sanitizer, if we didn't have signage. There's some other bigger, more complicated questions, but those are those are the uh, the, the well-known ones. And you know the uh, the CDC, the OSHA, um, and uh, WEDC all have guidance out there. So um, business owners hate to be second guessed. I think we if we at least do those basic things, uh, we'll uh, we'll be doing some things right. And maybe one last question. Um, it's maybe more of a business philosophy question. But if a, an employee is working effectively from home right now. Uh, should a, an employer consider just allowing them to continue doing that? Yeah, so this gets back to my point about consistency with uh, 
with exceptions that are bona fide, thoughtful, and defensible. Um, one of the this, this points to really challenges on both sides. The first is there's a certain loss of engagement, a loss of energy that happens as the workforce is is dispersed. Uh, Bob Monnet's column in the Business Journal yesterday got at that point, and and there's lots of recent uh, writings about how people are looking forward to get back, getting back to the office. So um, there's a certain energy that happens when people get back to the office. And I think, especially after the first two weeks of this, uh, folks could kind of feel that. On the other hand, uh, the question is, as a business owner, can you really measure, can you point to the lack of efficiency, the lack of productivity, uh, the type of tasks that can be done remotely versus those that cannot? And then we get into this bit of a dance or a tussle in terms of why can't this continue? Um, and so that, that becomes a larger question that you have to answer for a whole class of employees. And then, uh, as we pointed out, some with exceptions uh, pointing in various different directions. So right. Thank wanna, you to all our panelists and thank you to everybody who asked really thoughtful questions today. Yeah, I wanna again uh, thank uh, Mark and Dr. Cassidy, Dr. Raymond, Rebecca, Ann. Very much appreciate this. Uh, we could probably go on for another 45 minutes with questions. Um, and this, to me, just points out why this is the next normal and it's going to be with us for some time. And the same tensions that were with us during the crisis and recovery are going to be with us in the next normal as we operate. So, again, we appreciate the partnership with the Medical College uh, in standing up this best practice uh, toolkit. Um, we're going to be, again, providing uh, more information through the webinars on Tuesday. Uh, you can join us tomorrow afternoon at 3.30. Um, and I have a, 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 a feeling that this won't be the last time uh, we try to get you back on the program. Uh, as everybody uh, starts to operate here, uh, we're going to be challenged with different protocols and different implementation of those protocols. So this is a discussion that uh, appropriately is going to need to continue. So again, thank you all. Um, have a safe and healthy rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thank you.